Yo, it's the Rap Radar Podcast. My name is B-Dot. Elliot Wilson. Yeah, Elliot, how you feeling, man? I'm feeling good, man. We in the Bay Area, man. We repping the colors yeah, officially, I mean? you know what I'm saying? I seen it. I Absolutely. seen the black and orange. I seen the green and yellow. I'm like, okay. I'm like, but this yeah, man, 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 rapper, entrepreneur, cannabis king. The real life cookie Burn. monster. Man, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, brother. I'm here. Feels burner, good to be man. Alive. Congrats, bro. Congratulations, you, brother. Burner. Appreciate that. Forbes cover, brother. Can we start there, man? Not, not that's not that's no small feat, man. We've been in media for a minute, man. Bro. Yeah, that's a, it's the next level of like recognition as a businessman. Like a lot of, I know a lot of billionaires, but I don't know a lot of billionaires that got that cover. And so, yeah. you know, it felt good to get that. Like they really recognize in the business to level up. Like you know, so it feels good. Did How you get it? that call? Like was it a power call? Like is this coming? Or yeah, did you hire a kick-ass man, publicist? Like what was the process? Like they called me and said, "Yo, they want you to be on the uh, cover of Forbes magazine." I said, "Really? Well, that's amazing." Where are they based out of? They said, "You know, New York." I said, "Well, I hate to be, you know, I hate to say this, but I'm chilling with the family and I just beat cancer, right?" So wow. I was at the house in Montana and I said, "You know, I I never thought I'd be able to make it back to this house. I'm really just soaking this up right now, you know." So I really appreciate it, but I'm not really down to get on a plane from here and go to New York. Yeah. I really want to enjoy the summer house and enjoy it, you know, just enjoy life right yeah, now. And they absolutely. said, "Okay, you sure?" I'm like, "Yeah." And then they called me back. They said, "Yo, they want to fly out to you." I said, "You're fucking kidding me." Wow. I live in like a small town, you know, mm-hmm. in where in Montana where I was and. And they flew out. And so the, to me, that was like maybe even doper. You know, mm-hmm. the photographer flew out and then um, the homie that interviewed me flew out and we got to spend time on the lake and, and really chop game. And it was way more personal. So, I mean, just the fact they flew out like that, like, that's big. I thought they were going to tell me to go fuck myself. You know, so <laughs> you were bold enough to potentially turn down a Forbes. Yeah, because I was because thinking about life. You know, I was thinking yeah. about just like life and wanting to enjoy life and just being in that moment with the with the fam and the dogs and just being like, I'm not really on a hype to go to New York right now. You know, so man, shout out to Forbes. How yeah. has business been since landing on the Forbes cover? Did like help the brand be taken even more serious? Yeah, I think it helped normalize it a little more because, you know, a lot of other companies, like we've had a lot of opportunities with like footwear and things like that to do some really cool things. And they look at it and they're like, oh, it's Bernard the Weed Guy, you know? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. kind of put me like in a cat, like a little box for a while. But I think the Forbes cover kind of normalized it. Hey, this business is real mm-hmm. and it's thriving right now. It's being recognized by platforms like this. So it's definitely helped. And then a couple other things following that helped as well. So, yeah. Yeah, the writer had a quote I want you to address. He said, this story is about how the federal government continues to botch opportunities to legalize the cannabis industry mm-hmm. and lift the $72 billion economy out of the shadows. In a decade, Burner has built cookies into the buzziest global brand of cannabis, despite massive over-regulation, over-taxation. I mean, what he's saying is that, like, it's not easy to sell legal weed. You know, you guys know. You, you can go buy an eighth of weed on the street for like 35 bucks, 40, 40 bucks and get yeah. some fire. But you go to go into a dispensary, it's like 70 bucks for taxes. And so what they're saying is that like the federal government has not even legalized it yet. And the states that have have done such a poor job on like making it fair for the consumers and making it fair for the operators where no one's making money. People are blowing money. It just doesn't really make sense right now. So yeah. I think he was. Uh, and I think they were kind of impressed by what we've been able to do with that scenario because it's not it's not easy. Yeah. It's super tough. Right. Yeah. You said the actual weed industry is hard to make money in, though, right? Absolutely. Why is that? I mean, just the way it's set up, like laws like 280 doesn't allow you to write off your employees or your costs of operations. So think about that. You're a business, but you can't write off your costs to Crazy. operate. Mm. Like, how is that even fair to anyone? Right. Mm. And um it's hard too because, like I said, there's a thirty percent tax on herb. Like if you go buy eighth, you're paying like almost thirty percent tax just to buy that product. When you look at food and beverages, it's like what, like eight percent or something like that. So what's what's the big what's the big margin for? Why are you taking thirty percent? And then what are you actually doing with that thirty percent? Are you giving it back to social equity? Mm-hmm. No. Are you giving it back to people affected by the drug war? No. So now you guys are just being greedy for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. Then you said another hurdle is cultivation, right? Yeah. Can you explain what that is? It's just hard to deal with a living plant. Like mm-hmm. you're dealing with a living plant. So you got a warehouse full of weed. You think you think you know everything. I mean, there could be all kinds of hurdles from, you know, mold to insects. And, you know, get, you can burn the plants by the lights or, you know, have your pH off. And so it's just tough to grow weed. It, you're dealing with a living plant. And when you try to replicate what you're doing in California and other markets, it gets even harder because of environment and shit like that. And there's a lot of rapper inspired marijuana brands on the market right now, but how and why has Cookies been able to separate themselves from the pack? 
Cause I've been selling weed and I, and, and <laughs> I've been the weed man for like, you know, forever. 20 years. Right? Yeah. For 20 years before I've been doing it legally for 20 years. So let's just call it 24, 26 years. I've been selling weed. And so people, people know me for that. I've documented it and people know I really care about this shit. And we actually really put out real genetics. We, I mean, we're not just putting shit in a bag and calling it something, you know, and mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's, that's fine. People do want to support their favorite artists or support celebrities, but what we do is real, it's organic, it's documented, it's, it's legacy. Mm. And speaking of legacy, you expanding it, man. Congratulations again for the flagship store in New York City. Man, that, that shit looked was like wild. a movie, man. That, that made, one, it made me homesick when wow. I saw you tear down Herald Square. Man. 30 man. Street from 34th. Yeah, Miracle on 34th Street is about to be big <laughs> for the Christmas. We're going to have to do a big smoke out there or something. But that building is dope, man. Mm -hmm. Like, and the fact that we got that building, we got the whole building. Wow. Like, all the whole building. I'm actually flying to New York tonight to go to go finalize, like, what those floors look like. Mm -hmm. You know, floor two, three, four, and five, and then the Ooh. rooftop. How meaningful was it to have it at that location in New York? Was it always the plan to come to New York? Nah, I mean, it was always the plan to come to New York, but to go that big, nah, we never, we never thought that we'd be able to go you that know, big. You know what's so crazy about cookies? Yeah, because I don't smoke. I only knew it as a clothing brand at first, and didn't even know the connection at first of it. That's amazing. Yeah. That means I did my job because <laughs> there's people right now out there claiming that the clothing was just a front for the cannabis. It's like, no, we did. 60 million dollars last year in clothing and i yeah. i built that that business hand by hand yeah with, I, the, the, with the diamond life the supreme like he was competing in that yeah, market no, I was, that's how i, I was, looked at those clothes that when i and i was clowned on at first at first yeah. they were telling me like man he's just a weed brand he's not this he's not that and so i felt like that extra like, underdog you know motivation i'm like oh yeah well, shit, let me pop off my shit but yeah the clothing to have that clothing brand in in new york city of that and have that presence of that magnitude mm -hmm. it's a big statement and the turnout turnout was a huge statement too. I was nervous as hell. I'm like, are people mm -hmm. gonna line up for the clothes? Cause you know, everywhere in New York they're selling weed right now. So yeah. people wanted the weed from us. So I was like, are they actually gonna line up and support just just yeah. the clothing? Or are they gonna be upset we're not selling weed? And they weren't tripping. What is that connection to your consumers? Like they they are very vigilant about it, right? They really rep the pride pride of the brand of it. They line up for it. Like, what do you think it is that you keep them engaged and connected to this? Group? I think it's because I engage with them. And they've they witnessed me build the same brick by brick from the ground up and kind of like the working man's hero almost because I'm I've opened up a lot like I've shared my journey like from the cancer shit mm -hmm. you yeah. know uh, with my daughter like I just, I share a lot about my life and the stuff that people can relate to a lot of rappers these days are in constant character mm -hmm. they're they're in character they're not really mm -hmm. they're not I let people see me as me you know and yeah. I think that it really resonates with them and it's relatable and I think that's why they they support the fuck out what we do. We got the clothing. We got the marijuana. You also heard you coming out with a tea soon. Yeah, what kind of tea? Oh, a like tea? a beverage. Yeah, yeah, California iced tea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds refreshing. It sounds refreshing. I mean, hey, you know, Arizona iced tea was a favorite, but I'm from Cali, you know, so <laughs> California iced tea will be a medicated, medicated beverage line as well as like a non-medicated, just a good chocolate but beverage. Yeah. yeah, you're getting clientele from all over, man. Also, uh, on the Gotti project, you talked about how the government of Ontario is your biggest client. Oh, yeah. I was just kind of flexing like, you know, like a lot of drug dealer rappers. They just talk shit that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so it was cool to me that like government officials from Canada got on a Zoom with me and asked me how to sell more legal weed. Wow. And we were selling a lot of weed in Canada at the time. They were blown away that like in six minutes we sold like. A crazy amount of herb online so the way it works in canada is that they'll release your menu to everyone all the buyers online and then they buy what they want and so when we dropped our shit it was like gone wow yeah. and so i was like man like they were so amazed by how much weed we sold and how fast we sold it um and then you know from canada you'll send like two thousand pounds to germany and stuff like that on a plane and for like someone from the street that's the most amazing shit ever to hear that and to know that that's happening that they're loading up like planes with weed and sending it to other countries. So, you know, to get on a call with the government was cool as fuck. Wow. I was like, I wish the U.S. government was asking me how to sell more weed. Like, that'd be a lot cooler. But Canada, you know, they just wanted that good marketing advice and how to get how to get legacy players to like advocate more for the legal side. And I was just giving them game on that. And I thought that was really cool. Do you feel like things are changing? Yeah, I seen I seen the news last night. Like Missouri legalized, um, Maryland legalized. It's gonna happen. 
I think the federal government is just kind of waiting to figure out how they're going to make their money and control this as much as possible mm -hmm. because it's something that people have traditionally grew on their own. And like, it's like such an underground scene that they're mm -hmm. just not really knowledgeable about. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to figure out how to like sink their teeth into everything all the way. Word. So, but it's changing. It's definitely changing. Absolutely. And even though cookies is doing well, your music is still your passion, though, right? Ooh. It's therapy, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we got this new double album out. Is it cool to call it a double album? Yeah, okay. it, yeah, yeah. Twenty eight records. Yeah. Okay. Seed to sell. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty saw, songs on thirty there, songs. Man. Yeah. This Fire. is his forty seventh album. Yeah, forty seven like a motherfucker. It's just, <laughs> just, yeah. But if you know what's cool about it is like it's almost like a journal too because when you just reference Canada, it's like that's what was happening right there. Like yeah. on that record. Like before I, before I brought it to Nas, I was in the room. I just got off FaceTime with the government, right? Mm -hmm. And I just went in there and boom, laid that verse. And it was just what was really happening, yeah. right? Wow. And so like you listen to Gotti, you know, I, I recorded that during, uh, before my cancer battle. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to get the craziest lineup of artists possible. And it was very Superstar, feature heavy. Superstars, yeah. yeah. And it was A&R, like it was A&R, like a fucking pro. Like you listen to some of the records on Gotti, it's like, wow, how'd y'all pull this shit off, mm -hmm. right? But with, with From Sea to Sales, I just beat the cancer situation. And I wanted to kind of ball hog a little bit. Mm. <laughs> kind of like double down. Like, look, I've been doing this for X amount of years. My my success has only climbed. It never like really dropped. Yeah. I never had the pressure of being on the radio or being like a mainstream artist. Mm. So I was like, let me just do for my fans what they want to hear, which is like, just like, you know, myself on a lot of these records and just kind of like the beats I, I really fuck with and shit like that. I didn't really feel the pressure like I felt on Gotti. Gotti, I felt pressure. I was like, oh, I might die. I got to make the sickest album mm -hmm. without trying to like sound commercial and rap like other cats. Like, how do I do that? And so this one, I was like, ah, I could just do my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was like a breath of fresh air. You put out a project every year since 2013. Damn. Yeah, <laughs> probably multiple. I remember yeah. in 2000, it was like 2009 or 2011, one of the year I put out five and mm -hmm. they all did really well for me. But, you know, music was kind of like a thing I was just doing to... As a hobby, I had some bread and I kind of fucked with it as a fan, like just want to put artists on on different type of beats. But then when I needed it to start working, it started working. Mm -hmm. Like when I walked away from from the street shit and walked away from everything I did coming up and I needed legal money to be there. Mm -hmm. It's the craziest thing. Like I could survive off my music. And mm -hmm. that's why I laugh like people. But oh, bro, I rap, but man, checks are beautiful. <laughs> I own my whole catalog. I got 47 of them. A lot of big group albums, you know, dope group albums. So, yeah. you know, when I needed that music money to kick in, it kicked in. Yeah. And I'm able to get paid great money for shows and festivals. So I'm, I'm fucking blessed. And a lot of that's with the good brother, uh, Ghazi at Empire, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was, I think I was one of Ghazi's first clients. Mm -hmm. I was at Ingrus and one day he called me, he was like, yo, I switched your catalog over to my new shit. You're rocking with me. I was like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do? And, I, and, and guys, tell you, I was the kind of guy who used to go up to guys and buy, here's a hundred bucks, upload my shit ASAP. And he's like, yeah. you don't got to pay me. It's my oh, job. You said they, your boys call you on demand. You're always trying yeah. to make something happen. Yeah. <laughs> like I would walk in the ingrus. I'm like, yo, guys, he upload this ASAP, brother. Here, hundred bucks. He's like, mm, that's my job. I ain't got it. So he, he's seen, he's seen the dedication to the craft, but I've been down with him since, since then. We put out a lot of shit. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. do you put pressure? Like, do you, do you have a hit record or things like that? No, nah, like, I don't want a hit record. Yeah. Really? Yeah, no, nah, because the second you you have a hit record, you come on the radio, burns popping, burn, burn. Then the second you're off the radio, oh, man, what happened? He mm. fell off. Like, yeah, look yeah, at how many, you know, like, I, I, I don't even want to say any names, but look how many people <laughs> had a big record. Yeah. And then never, it's like, I don't want that pressure. I like what I got right now. It's cool. Like I honestly get paid for some festivals more than some of these dudes with big records get paid, and I could sell out shows more than some of these dudes that yeah. with big records could sell out shows. Like I see news about people having to cancel tours and cancel shows, or you know, do discounts on tickets. Like it's good. It's good having like a cult following and like yeah. you know, owning your lane. Like I own my lane. I'm good with that. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't want the pressure of having a big record like that. Mm, okay, it makes sense. Even like when I send records to big artists, like mm -hmm. I'm not going to send it to them, hear it, and I'm a rap on a beat and be like, this is going to go to this person. I don't even want the pressure of having to follow them up. Like, I, I, I ain't doing that. <laughs> How'd you come up with from from seed to sale? Why was that the topic? Because we cover everything from, from, from actual breeding to like, you know, selections to growing the flower, holding the dispensaries, making the hash. Um, Everything you can do from from seed to sale, we yeah. actually do. We're fully integrated. You know, we we handle everything. So yeah. I don't know what low temp means in the sense. I love the song, but what's low temp? yeah, low temp is like. Have you ever seen people take dabs? Remember when Corrupt's brother took that dab and fell over? 
Do you remember? You ever yeah, seen that? I think I have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, there was a whole era of like hot dabs where people would take a dab and it was really hot. It's a temperature when you're smoking hash. So oh, okay. before you guys came here, I was smoking a bunch of hash downstairs, and, <laughs> and we we're hitting Full that. disclosure. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, that's why I haven't even picked up. I'm loaded right now. <laughs> really, 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 really loaded right now. But you know, the low temp allows for better taste and better experience, and you don't have to cough your lungs out. Like I'm a grown ass man. Yeah. I don't have to prove nothing to nobody. Like all right. those big hot rips that everyone's choking and blowing out all the smoke. Like I don't have to do that shit. Yeah. I don't taste that shit like a player. Right. And in release with this project, it was with the. A strain, right? The body strain from a yeah. strain, right? Yeah. So no one's ever released a body of music with genetics, right? And so mm -hmm. my goal was to give people exclusive one-time release genetics, right? And that that the reason why it actually turned out to be a double album, we were waiting for the C project to be done. It takes multiple years to breed something, right? Mm -hmm. To do it right. And um it took a little longer than expected. So I had a little extra time. That's why I added so many records. But we released the album with the pack of seeds. So my fans that bought the pack of seeds are in a private Discord room with me. Mm -hmm. And as they pop their seeds, they're going to be able to share their progress with me. Let me see what they find. And then I'll hold a private cannabis cup for everyone that bought the seeds to see, you know, who found the best variety from this from this fiend hunt. So it's a really interactive project with the music. Like besides the music, they're able to engage with me on something that we all bond together, which is, you know, yeah. weed and cultivation. So I thought I thought it was pretty genius, and it was kind of like similar to Nip's uh, "Proud to Pay" campaign. Like mm -hmm. I don't really want to get into like the numbers and stuff like that, but that pro that project ran it up. Mm -hmm. We ran it up like that, yeah, for sure. Wow! Even with the success that you have, and throughout this project, it seems like while listening to it, you feel like you're becoming more cynical of people in business throughout this project. Yeah. Cutthroat, cutthroat. Yeah, yeah. Right. like song like "No More Deals." It sounds like you're fed <laughs> up with people. Who hurt you, Bernard? Who hurt you? Who did you hurt? <laughs> Man, that day I I was so mad. At, I was so mad that day, man. Like, I'm really a CEO for real. Like, I really actually deal with my company 100% hands on with employees, with deal structures, with you know business partners. I I have hundreds of business partners, and I in you know in business it's cutthroat, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like you no know, more no more deals was hella funny because I was just. Like, again, it's my journal. I was like, I hung up a call. I was like, I'm cool off all this shit. Man. I'm, <laughs> I'm good. No more deal. I'm not doing no more deals. And yeah. it's funny. It even became a song. It's I can't believe that we put that out. But it's just, it's what's happening. So I think I'm just getting fed up with people's greed, man. Mm. I've seen a lot of true colors. And it's just getting, the more I grow, the more they come out. Yeah, it was a line. You said loyalty is the only thing you regret. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people we've been loyal to just switch up. You know, and that's in every industry. That's in music. But in cannabis, it's like the new dot com. So everyone's trying to rush mm. to like the top. We know only a few players will make it. And so we constantly use our platform to elevate people, to bring people into business, to bring people into the market. Then they get a little shine, a little juice. Yeah. And they just act like they're the biggest. They want to build around you instead of building with you. And that shit to me, especially after the cancer shit, just played me out. Like, I'm like, man, I can't really see that no more. Yeah. Like. I don't care. I'm comfortable where I'm at in life. I'm comfortable who I am as a businessman. I know what I'm going to get done, but it sucks to try to bring someone up with you yeah. and put them on real game and spend time and energy with them. And then they just try to build around you in a very, like, very spiteful way. Mm -hmm. You would think a motherfucker by bro, I love you for, for the look, but I'm going to go ahead and spin off and do this. But now nah, they're trying to sink you. They want to take you down. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of sick of having my guard up. It's like, do I really yeah. want to live my whole life with my guard up? Or do I want to, I, re I could retire right now, but so addicted to working so that's why you're kind of hearing the music because that's what's going on right now mm -hmm. it's yeah. my way of venting that's why i still make music you know? that's right. how you did a tweet is on halloween you said time to play ball boys my mother raised me right i believe in karma my heart's always been pure and you stay the same mm -hmm. i was like okay nobody yeah, <laughs> nah, off that day you know i can't wait to <laughs> just speak about predatory investment bro mm -hmm. you know when when that when i'm able to open my mouth and talk i'm gonna talk my shit yeah but not only talk shit, i'm gonna educate people i'm like Yo, this is how people try to really get you in business. Yeah, predatory investment. Yeah. About us, you interpolated Tupac. You, you touched on like two faced kind of folks. You said investors try to bring you down while you were sick. Yeah. Is that kind of alluding to what you're talking about? Yeah, and I can't really talk about it 100%, but just that line right there, like picture having cancer, right? And like picture fighting for your life and, you know, and still running your company and someone just trying to take advantage of that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's fucked up. Mm -hmm. that's a cold hearted motherfucker and they're lucky that this is not 20 years ago mm -hmm. you know because I'd probably be thinking a lot different but again like that's the therapy side of music and that's why I love mm -hmm. my music because this shit's real and I'll be able to look back at it like a journal one day and be like yeah during that time I was going to do that 
Yeah. But and the next album, you probably hear some major elevation. And be like, <laughs> yeah, slid right through that motherfucker real quick, right? So yeah, because it's a lot of joints like you know, cutthroat, whole new lens. I'm like, yo, somebody's pissing bro off. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of somebody's man. It's a lot of pe- it's a lot of people, yeah. bro. But you know, they hear those albums too, and I get so mad because it's very. No one knows who it is or what it yeah, is, yeah. but they know what the fuck it is. Yeah. They know they know who the fuck they are, and so it hits different. It's like it's like you know when rap beef comes out and someone drops it. Oh, you hear? You got dude. Like I'm yeah. doing that with you know, yeah. you know yeah. some whole other level type dudes. They just they don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> you know they get you know. But I guess that's the other side that comes when you Rolling Stone puts out a list and they say these are the wealthiest hip hop artists and it's names we know like Daisy, Puff, Kanye, Dr. Dre, and you're right there, Burners, right there in that group. It's like. Everything comes with that, right? All this man, that shit, that shit hit on the birthday. I got that call on the birthday. I was like, "You fucking kidding wow. me? What the fuck?" Uh, well, that's gonna come with a whole lot of new shit for sure. <laughs> it's like having a hit record. It's worse. <laughs> Burner fourth wealthiest Four rapper. Ten. It's like, Four ten. It's like, and and the way that you know, they're like, Burner passed up Doctor Dre. It's like that's <sighs> fucked up. As in, you know, I don't want to read that shit. That sounds scary. It sounds like a lot of responsibility. It's like but, Kanye took a loss. But Bird is out here for yeah. say, right? Yeah. But that was cool too because you know, like a lot of people people say, Well, Burner's not a rapper and he, he got all his money from something else. Well, so did everyone else on that list. Mm. Jay did his thing with business. Mm-hmm. So did Puff. So did Ye. So yeah. did Dre. I did Only the same really thing. Only Birdman and Drake would make the uh, music yeah, money. Yeah. It became yeah, no. super massive. Drake is money. super paid off music, yeah. but he's not Bird on that list. Time, and I respect yeah. the fuck that Drake is the homie, but mm-hmm. he's not on that list, right? And mm-hmm. It's the business side of things that really elevate you. And I feel like there's like a small percent of people, you know, 50, 50 gets it. A bunch of other, you know, there's a couple other people that get it, but that business side of it, if you use music as your platform to build your business, then it's... The biggest I don't understand why people don't get it. Mm. And we but we celebrate that too. I just feel like maybe people still sleep on you a little bit with that, right? Yeah. Because you're one of the most successful businessmen in hip hop, and that's what we promote. The music elevates that. Yeah, I love being an underdog though. It makes me happy. Like when people are like, Oh, this ain't real. I wonder if this is that was another question. Is this real? <laughs> hey man, that guy he they did a tax l- return. <laughs> hey, that guy looked at tax returns, he looked at a bunch of things. Wow. It was like it was a probably like a six month process. Yeah, wow. yeah. Man. A lot of due diligence. Wow. So you said passion, patience, persistency, and purpose made this possible mm-hmm. to get to get to where you're at. Yeah, I've been passionate. I've been very persistent. I've been very patient. I've waited. I could have gave up a long time ago. A lot of things happened to me that would have made a lot of people give up. And then I have purpose behind what I'm doing. I love what I do because it genuinely brings people together. If you think about weed, I wouldn't know how to be what I know now if it wasn't for weed. I feel like weed is the one thing bringing peace um, to the table. It's it's uniting people all over the world. I can go somewhere and uh, someone will be waiting in line for a cookie store, does not speak English, and, and is just totally obsessed with the brand. I've mm-hmm. seen people in Spain, Scotland, Ireland, Italy with our tattoos mm-hmm. you know, on their head, their arms. Are, it's like, oh, this shit's real. It's really uniting people. So that's why I still do. I got purpose behind what I do. It's not just about the bread. The bread's cool. You know, but I invest my bread in things like where you're at right now. Yeah. This is a creative comp. I just want to put it all back into the you know the process. Yeah, talk about this place. It's a, it's a work. It's a work in progress, right? Yeah, now. you're just- you're you're in the trap house right now. You know, this is <laughs> this is the only functional room right now. Um, but you know, it's a twenty thousand square foot building dedicated to like media, creative design, um, just just marketing, branding, like everything that we've done. I've never had an office. Mm. So if I made the top four wealthiest rapper with no office, then what am I going to do with the compound? Wow. Ooh. I've been working from the house on the <laughs> they, couch. They wow. say you're on pace for that Billy. This, 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 man, this, I'm coming this. for it, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my name is Burn. It starts with a B. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to get there. Uh, you're burn out. You're there. Yeah. Out, has a nice ring to it. Yeah, I'm trying to get there, but, you know, very classy. I want to get there yeah. in a very classy, respectful way. I want people to respect, you know, the process to get there. I've been working my ass off. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I work 19-hour days. I don't stop. So that hustle, man, is it something in the water here in San Francisco? Because you call the city the birthplace of independent music, right? Mm-hmm. And what is it about this city that, you know... We have, we have some pioneers, man. Like, you look at, like, you look at E-40. He laid, he laid the independent blueprint mm-hmm. for us. You got the people like JT, the bigger figure from the city. And, mm-hmm. you know, you got they Master P was out... Game. Yeah, Master P was out here when he learned a lot of game about independent music and took that shit to a whole other level. So mm-hmm. the Bay Area has always been setting them trends for the independent music. But also, I think we we're so unrecognized out here 
think about how many people from the Bay actually really made it like to a whole nother level. Right. So I feel like we also have that drive in us to want to push harder and harder. And, um, you know, shit, man. I'm Mexican too, bro. So the work ethic is just in me. My dad, <laughs> my dad is one of the hardest working dudes I've ever met. Mm. I mean, he works his ass off. Right. You said on Double Up, it's still cutthroat in the Bay, right? In what uh, ways? Man, listen, don't leave nothing in your car. Mm. Do not leave nothing in your car. They'll pop these windows so fast out here. But, you know, the Bay Area is a very small place. And going back to what I said, not many people have made it out here. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of envy. It's a lot of weird energy. It's like any city. If you still live in your area and you made it, you're going to have to deal with things. But, you know, the Bay is a cutthroat spot. It's cool to see, like, you and Larry June, you guys did a collab with one of my favorites, Cooks and Orange Juice. Yeah. And he's from the Bay as well, like, working together in tandem. Yeah, man. I gave Larry June a lot of game. He gave me a lot of good energy. It was a good energy transfer, for sure. Like, he's a good dude. He he brings a lot of good vibes to the table, for sure. I love conglomerate. I, I was telling B that we don't even realize that the homie Mozzie's incarcerated right now. A lot of us yes. didn't really... Yeah, he actually, bro, he came there the night before he went to go turn himself in. Like, wow. he, me and Mozzie got a closer relationship. We bring a lot of energy out of each other. He reminds me of the Jack, rest in peace to the Jack. But when I used to do albums mm -hmm. with the Jack, yeah. um, like he brought a certain kind of energy out of me and he brings that energy out of me. And I think I do the same for him. Mm -hmm. But we recorded the, that song, another song before he had to go in. And um, we had some chicken parmesan and some Casio <laughs> yeah. Pepe. He said he never tried that shit. He was fired up Wait, on didn't it. Try but what? He never, he never tried chicken parmesan or Casio Pepe before that night. Mm. Yeah, we had a ma little mafia meal. <laughs> Conglomerate's a great record. My brother Cosmo and the hook, he mm -hmm. produced it as well. And that's the type of shit I just feel like a lot of artists are running from right now. Yeah. I'm not really into catchy tunes. I want some shit you could really ride to. Yeah. Like too. A song that you said is you're really proud of is uh, Cold Champagne for Lunch. You said this record is deeper than what many may think. Uh, yeah. What makes it so special? Nah, that's... Um, so if you listen to Hook, it's like, uh, now there's no more stress for months on Cold Champagne for Lunch. So when I got done with the cancer treatment, they, they make you do a test every three months. And it's a, it's a blood test and it looks for a circulating tumor DNA. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know... You take this test every three months and it tells you whether there's some cancer cells floating around in your body or not. And I told the homies that didn't really quite understand. I was like, that's like if you raw dogged a random chick in Vegas and you took AIDS test and you're, you're waiting to get it back. Probably going to be a little nervous, right? Except this is a lot realer. You yeah. know you had cancer. You know you just did surgery. You know you just did chemotherapy. Is it still in your body or not? Mm. So when I got the information that when I got the, t the news back that it wasn't, it was like, ah. Fuck. Mm. Well, at least I know I got three months without worrying about this shit. Finally, for the first time in in six or eight months, right? So that cold champagne was like a. It was like my first record after getting that news, pretty much. Mm. So every three months you're gonna have to check. Every three months for five years. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. But the the more you pass, the better it looks for you. Yeah. Mm. And on you also preach back to when when you're doing a press run for Gotti that it was early detection, right? You have hired a private doctor that's how you found out yeah it's weird because it's stage three so the way colon cancer works and a lot of black and browns are getting this in the early 30s right now so mm -hmm. everyone should screen for this asap like it doesn't matter how healthy you are trust me the food we've been eating is fucked so you know i was stage three it was about to bust through my colon wall but the sad thing is you don't feel symptoms and cancer until it's too late mm -hmm. so if i was throwing up blood or if my kidneys or my side hurt or whatever and whatever the other symptoms would have been, it would have been stage four already, and it's almost impossible to really fix all the way. Mm. I did a random. I was sitting there one day. I was like, man, I got bread. I got everything I need in life. What is it that I'm missing right now? I was like, I should probably get a private doctor, probably look into my health a little bit and make sure I'm cool because I want to be here for my kid. You know right. what I'm saying? And when I found this private doctor, um, he offered a test um, that just came out two months prior, that test for 50 different types of cancer. And I was like, sure, I'll take it, blood test, whatever. Mm. And he found it like that. So I think I was one of the first people that that test actually saved. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't really fit the demographic for their target audience uh, to actually really get behind a real campaign for that test. Mm -hmm. But I went on the radio still and I told everyone about it. I was like, well, even if you guys don't want to use me in, in the platform you guys have, I'm finna talk about this shit mm -hmm. everywhere I go. Because, for your people, yeah. Yeah, I because we should know about this shit and we should be taking this shit. It costs a thousand dollars to do that test. Some motherfuckers out here buying Gucci belts and going to the club and shit. You mm -hmm. might as well go get this test because right. we've been we've been getting played. Right. You don't know nightmares you talk about that too. You said like when things change when you're closer to death. Like what are some of the things that, you know, change your perspective? 
yeah, like just not allowing negativity to really affect me no more. Enjoying every single day as much as I can. Enjoying the family, putting the family first, just like I did with the Forbes cover. When yeah. they called, I was like, nah, I'm chilling right now. Like, I don't feel the pressure to have to do that. Also, like uh, picking your projects a little more wiser and, you know, just kind of like cir- t- tying up the circle a little bit and, you know, just just really understand like, man, this shit's really precious. It could change overnight. They could change again overnight. It already changed overnight. So we're blessed to be here. I faced my biggest fear. I ain't really tripping no more. Like, I'm not scared to fly anymore. I used to be scared as fuck to fly. Really? Yeah, no, I used to be really bad. And uh, the other day we had probably the worst turbulence we had in years. And I was sitting next to a therapist and we were just talking about life and shit. (laughs) And I seen her little palms all getting sweaty and shit. I was helping her out. Wow. Yo, we're blessed to even be here to feel this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't worry about it. The food we eat's worse than this. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel way less safe driving with my assistant. Mm -hmm. We're good. We're good right now. So. It just really helped me. It's crazy to hear you talk about being afraid to fly because you talk about those trips on Southwest Airlines in 98, man. Man, see, now, <laughs> here's the thing. It was weird because, like, when I was young, I wasn't scared to fly, right? And I was flying, doing my thing. Shout out to Southwest. We was on the bird with things, right? <laughs> so I wasn't really scared to fly. But when I started getting, like, fake successful, like when I had my baby and I started getting fake successful, and I thought there was this weird thought, like, I could get rich one day. Mm. What if I die on the fucking plane? I don't, I don't get a chance to get rich, and I, it was the weirdest fear ever. And you know, like, that comes with some other things too. Like, um, I had the feds fucking with me for a long time when I was getting off the planes at LAX. You talk D- about it on gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. DEA used to be waiting for me, go through my shit, search wow. me, question me, ask me hour and a half questions, make me miss my connecting flight. Um, I went through a tropical tropical storm one time coming from Jamaica that really fucking scared the shit out of me. And the stewardess gave me a Xanax, I think. I asked her, I said, I don't think I'm about to have a heart attack on this bitch. I need something. And she gave me something and I I was all like out of it. When I got off the plane, the feds had pulled me when I got off the Jamaica flight. And so I think my trauma from flying was like mixed with the turbulence, but more about that experience with the fucking feds. That shit was whack. It was like a three year period. They're just fucking with me. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people fucking with the weed, man. It seems like you're really concerned uh, with this fentanyl crisis that's going on right now, man. You talk about it on pain, like fentanyl's trying to kill us all. Yeah, you know, fentanyl is like it's more for the people, like people that want to do like a Adderall they bought on the street, or people that want to do some coke or do some blow that they bought, or people that want to do like a Like a lot of people are doing drugs and don't know where the fuck it's coming from, and mm. I feel like you know I want to get all conspiracy doubt but i feel like there's some a group of people flooding our country with fentanyl on purpose and i'm just you know i lost my cousin to i lost my little nephew to it rest in peace you know so i'm seeing a lot of people close to me starting to die from fentanyl and i think it's some bullshit because none of them wanted to die none of them wanted to do fentanyl it was just in shit that they were taking Mm. so i think that there's um there's overproduction of fentanyl and it's coming into the u.s it's not the cartels People are saying it's a mix. Nah, the cartels are pissed. Mm. They, there's been messages out there saying that if we find out who's lacing shit with fentanyl, it's a wrap for everyone because you're fucking with our business. Because people are scared to do drugs now, which, hey, look, drugs are bad. You shouldn't sniff or put anything in your mouth. Just stick with the mushies, <laughs> stick, with, stick with the herb. But for the people that do want to party because they've been doing it since before we were here, mm-hmm. they shouldn't have to worry about dying for some fucking drug that's being made and sat here on purpose. Right. You did mushrooms while making this album too, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mushrooms are good. You do mushrooms? Nah, I can't do anything you, like that. No mushrooms. For I'll you. be on the fucking roof of here jumping off, man. Now, if you just microdose a little bit, <sighs> it's good for the mind. It really mushrooms good for your body. I don't know. I think too much, so I'll start <laughs> tripping out, man, and talking to myself and pacing back and forth. And I do that sometimes too, but it's okay. You know, mm. it's fuck it, fuck it. Just get, get it <laughs> Look like uh, Mike Tyson did in that crowd recently. He was he was in there talking to himself. He, my boy, shout out to my boy Iron Mike, man. He was loaded in that crowd. <laughs> shout out to another guy uh, you try to get attention to, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah, I want to sit down with dude. He's he's a smart dude. A lot of people like a lot of celebrities want to talk to him, you know, because he's one of the richest dudes and shit. I just think the dude's got some really creative people around him. I mm-hmm. went to SpaceX. I got a tour of SpaceX. The employees over there are very forward thinking. There's a lot of black and browns in the building doing mm-hmm. their thing. Young, very creative, very innovative. And I think that he's the one dude breaking the barriers right now. Mm-hmm. If you think about the stuff that they're about to pull off, um, probably like in three or four years, you'll be able to go up in this big spaceship, mm-hmm. let the world orbit, and then come right back down where you're supposed to go. So no more flying cross country, no more turbulence. Mm. 
right? You're going to go up and save all kind of gas by going up, letting the world orbit and coming back down. You can get to, they said something like New York to London, like in like 90 minutes or some shit like that. So this, I fuck with that. Mm -hmm. Like we've been told by NASA that it's very far and it's very, that motherfucker came in here and started doing all kind of shit. So I just fuck with innovation. really. Right. And you want to do some sort of cross pollination with him and. Nah, you know, my whole goal with him was like, look, if you guys are really going to colonize Mars, you guys are going to need hemp, you're going to need cannabis. Mm -hmm. If you're going to try to put humans on Mars, right, if that's your goal, whether it be 300 years or 3,000 years, I know some of the best genetics in the world, not just from us, from all all my breeder partners all mm -hmm. around the world. And we know who has the best uh, sustainable hemp, like, you know, the best hemp genetics as well and because you're gonna need that for rope trees all that you can't just grow big ass trees on mars you right know, you have to get in that greenhouse and have rows of hemp to use for materials we know how how good hemp is so i just want to bless him with the time capsule and say this is a gift for me and my friends around the world mm -hmm. and whenever you guys make it to mars just make sure I got a little statue of myself up there. And that's it. And this is for y'all. Y'all hold it. You guys are going to have the best weed. You guys are going to have the best hemp. And people will be able to do something to keep their mind busy. Because I don't see someone going to Mars without smoking weed, man. I, that's just me. Maybe I'm thinking small or whatever. But you're going to go to a whole other planet and build that bitch out. And give them the good herb, man. Word. Let them put some plants by his tomato plants, man. Let them, let them harvest that good weed and clear his mind <laughs> after a long day of farming and shit, you know? But before you go into Mars, you're going to Hollywood, man. How are you acting now? The yeah. Low end theory? Yeah, low end theory, man. I got my first acting role, man. Okay. Like, we'll see how I do. I mean, I really want to do it. Um, besides that, I got a scripted series coming out on, on a pretty big network. It's called PAX. Um, it's about the Bay Area, about the rise of designer weed, about trafficking. It's like a real, it's a real mm -hmm. based on true events story. Yeah. That's going to be a scripted show on, uh, on on a pretty big network. I can't say which network, but kind of, kind of, you know, based on my shit, I'll be in the writing room created by me yeah. along with some other people. So that's going to be dope. And I, I thought it'd be the perfect layup to, to start building out my media, uh, you know, my media portfolio, whether it be acting in films, doing short films, writing my own films, like. I would love to get that look from this big network and then have a portfolio of my own shit mm -hmm. to follow up afterwards. So you was asked like, what kind of show should I host? What kind of content yeah. should I create? I saw you throwing it out there to the, yeah. to the fans. We're going to build some sets here. I'm going to do a couple shows here and just trying to see what people want. I'm a foodie. I want to do some food stuff, not with me in it, but like I want to curate some really good cooking shows. I want to, um, I want to do like, um, like a Shark Tank style show where like mm. I actually created fun with a couple other dudes, right? Found a couple other minorities that think like me, create like a three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar fund, have people come to the show and pitch us things, actually invest in the besides the investing part of things and actually showing like what we like and what we don't like, let's see what the fun do. Mm. Like so season one, where's that fun at? Did we lose money? Did we make money? Who fucked up? Who, <laughs> who who's the bad guy in the group? You know, are we gonna kick someone? So I I wanna do something like that. So shows like that, you know, just shit shit to I like content, man. Did you really lose a quarter ticket in the mail? You know, shit, uh things things go really wrong with the mail, man. You know, like <laughs> once once that shit leaves your leaves your hands, you have no uh, you have no control of it, bro. Whether whether someone yanks it or whether whether it be a post office employee finding it and yanking it, whether the feds take it and hold it to see if something's going on, or whether your partner says it got intercepted and, and just fucks you. Um, I think the show packs will have a lot of that gut mm. butterfly in your stomach kind of vibe to it because there's a lot of dark shit happens in that game. Oh, my God. Mm. I'm glad I ain't got to deal with none of that bullshit no more. Right. Oh, so this was illegal drug money back in those you days. You know, it so. might have been. Okay. You know? Allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah, you know, based on, uh, you know, fictional events, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, that's the good thing about PAX. There's going to be so much game about like the game like mm. the, and the Bay Area's yeah. role in it and the South's role in it, Atlanta and Houston's role in the weed game. Like a lot of crazy shit happened. Mm. Yeah, I didn't realize too that weed so much because of, of banks and stuff was frowned upon. So it's such a, such a cash heavy business, right? Like you, certain banks wouldn't even allow you to, you know, put money. Bro, in. They, they, kicked, they kicked me out of Wells. They kicked me out of uh, wow. First Republic. Um, What's that? What's that one bank that's super nice uh, that takes care of all the celebrities? Like a celebrity-driven bank. Um, I was in that thing for a little while. I don't know. I, I keep my money on the mattress. Well, I got kicked out of a lot of <laughs> banks that had nothing to do with cannabis. I'm talking yeah. about for my music money, straight from iTunes, for, straight from Empire mm -hmm. to this bank account. Yeah. Right. Not even my touring money. My touring money was in a different. Oh, you got to go. I'm like, but it shows for many years a check coming from Empire Distribution to this account. How is that anything? 
we don't like what you represent. You got to get out of our bank. So wow. they've, been, they've been hating. But and when they come back around, when things go federal, we're not going to bank with none of those motherfuckers. We're going to remember who was cool to us, and we fucking yeah. with that. I wouldn't be surprised if you had your own bank burner. Burn a bank. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> I would only do it to get a picture like Muhammad Ali, Ali like with that safe. Like I'd yeah. probably only do it like yeah, yeah. That, that Ali <laughs> photograph was just sick. I'd probably only buy a bank. Just, well, we bought a bank and made it a cannabis club already. Mm. We already did that. That was pretty cool. Wait, you bought a bank? Yeah, there's a bank in uh in Hayward. It's an old bank now. That's a cookie store. So that's, okay, that's fucking. That cool. kind of counts. It kind of counts. <laughs> but, dude, um, but when you were out there, did you have was there a time when you had a lot of money on you, or was the stress of carrying? Let's be so cash heavy and running around town. Hell yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, before the federal, so right now credit unions accept cash. You have to pay like a cool like a little amount on it. But like, bro, I mean, you're talking about a business that's all cash and. You have to get creative on ways to hide it and move it around. Yeah. Man. <laughs> One you can share? Yeah. Video games, my guy. Video games. I was living in a real life video game with yeah. that shit. It's yeah. fucked up. Yeah. yeah. It's very scary. Yeah. It's very it scary. Very targeted, right? But, you know, we were we were blessed to make it out of that era. And now they got credit unions that take cash. And I can't wait to. I think that show, like, now. So the show will cover kind of like street side of cannabis, yep. the medical side of cannabis, mm -hmm. and the legal side of cannabis. And the cool thing is the legal side is just as cutthroat as the street side, mm. especially with some of these regulations and having to move cash around and shit like that. And, yeah. and some of these fucking crazy ass investors and shit like that. So it gets, it gets, it stays rocky the whole time. It's not yeah. like a, oh my God, it's legal. It's all it's so clean so now. Good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> dealing with a whole nother animal right now. Shit, <laughs> got a whole nother animal. These guys are more scary than street cats. Mm. You talk about like, um, those partnerships are kind of tough. Like on the legacy, on the Gotti album, say you you dissolved another partnership. You didn't even care about it at the time. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I don't want to say which one, but you know, it's like partnerships, man. Like you partner with someone, you 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 try to build something. And some, not everyone gets the idea of like a long term building something for the long term. Uh, people want the brown bag right now. Well, not all, not all the times does the brown bag come. And and how many how many times you partner with someone and they're doing all kind of side deals and getting all kind of bread and just pocketing and not keeping it true to the group. And so, you know, that that particular partnership was like, thank God this partnership is out of here because mm -hmm. it was a more of a headache than a benefit to me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really wanting to build up anyone like that anymore. I'm kind of like, let me just focus on my core, my core brands, my core, my core group and stop trying to expand so much and trying to help everyone because not everyone's going to one, appreciate the help two know what to do with the juice and three, know how to keep it solid. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Speaking of solid, I feel like I'd like to see the connection you have with Wiz Khalifa, right? Like mm -hmm. he's on the current album. It's like, I guess that was kind of the first like hip hop co-sign you got in the sense of right him. Like, yeah, yeah, talent. nah. He um he gave me a good opportunity with Taylor Gang early on in my career, and I think he brought a lot of eyes to the table for me. And yeah, you know, we had a really good sound together too that people enjoy. Yeah, we got good chemistry, and yeah, man, Wiz the man. So I've been fucking with him since like two thousand nine, something like that. Mm. But never, it's never switched up. It's still pretty. Nah, it's my yeah. brother right there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel like I a lot of people want a group album for us, from us, and hopefully it happens one day. You know, that's what people have been asking mm -hmm. for. But yeah. other than that, man, we've been solid since. You know, I helped him with some of this cannabis stuff, and yeah. you know, he's doing his thing right now. And I think that we both elevate each other in a lot of different ways. Another rapper you've been uh, connecting with is uh, Jay Z, right? Yeah, I got an opportunity to talk to him a couple times. Yeah, you talked to uh, you say you. The level up was legendary. Can you talk about some of the conversations that you guys had? You know, I just got a chance to talk to him about business. And the fact I got a chance to talk to him was like, shit. I mean, that dude, is, he's a dude. And he's like the guy that we all look up to be, you know, and as a hip hop artist, as far as like spreading your wings and, and being able to like get into business outside of music. And so when I got a chance to talk to him, when he first got into his, his side, of, you know, his deal in cannabis, like, it was tied to you, the fact to even reach out. You know, mm -hmm. like I got a chance to talk to him. It was like, wow, all right, well, fucking, that's wild. <laughs> Jesus, all right. So we're 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 getting there yeah. now. You know, so shout out to Jay. Uh, probably like one of the smoothest, most unique dudes I've met as far as like business conversation. You yeah. know, some mm -hmm. pe some artists be all over the place and don't really know what they want to do. Or he's very calculated. He's very he's very smooth. For and, sure, and not even Puff's getting into the into the Puff is in the business, in the business, and he he did he he did a good move. He bought pretty pretty big assets, um, mm. three of them. So on the East Coast, and I think he, I think he knows what he's about to do as well. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I seem like you seem like you were saying the stories like thirty percent will be your stuff. You use other people like you seem open to mm-hmm. you know welcoming to other people coming into the market, Hell especially yeah. black and brown folk. Look, the more people that look like us, the better mm. because what's out there right now ain't it. And the good thing is, if I ever get a chance to talk to Puff, right? And he asks any advice about his business, I'll be able to tell him like, "Hey, here's a real genuine players right here that deserve that platform right mm. there." You know what I'm saying? So I know I could at least lead some of these bigger guys that but get big assets in the right direction of, you know, the real legacy players, stuff like that. Mm. You definitely win in in um, conglomerate. One that Elliot made reference to earlier. You said you remember days you thought you would never win, right? What was some? Why did you feel like that at that time? Life be hard, you know. <laughs> I mean. When I was growing up, when I was living in my dad's apartment, you know, his apartment was on top of a our restaurant, you know, studio apartment, me and my little brother, my dad, and one of the chefs all in one little space, you know, and this shit, it's just tough. And then, you know, coming up and, and, and being involved in the shit I would be in, things going wrong was tough. And also being the underdog is tough. Mm. I say I love it, but it's tough. You know, it's like even when you get the flowers, you're so scarred from being an underdog for so long that like it's still tough. Right. And so when I felt like I wouldn't make it, like I was working my ass off. I was doing everything right. Nothing would hit. It wouldn't hit. It wouldn't click. It wouldn't click. Like everything I was doing, it just wasn't working. I just I remember sometimes feeling like, man, should I just really go back to just the shit I came from? Mm. Should I really risk everything again and just do what I know how to do? Or should I stick with this dream of being a real CEO, entrepreneur, being mm-hmm. a clothing guy. Like I didn't, I didn't go to school for clothing. Mm-hmm. I didn't go to school for business. I didn't, I never graduated fucking high school. So, you know, I took a big, deep investment in myself and that shit was tough. Yeah. You talk about like back in the days, like 98, we had a smaller circle and then hidden messages. Like what was, even though with the success and, you know, the expansion, like why do you go back and think about those days? Because it was pure. You know what I'm saying? Those those dudes are my friends because they were my friends. You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. like a, what could we do with Burn? How could, how could we use what Burn is built to, to get us on? Or like there was no alternative motive. We were young. We were getting high. We were having fun, right? Mm-hmm. And the circle was real. Like those are the guys, like, God forbid, if I ever had to do some shit today, like someone really fucking fucked me over, I'd call the same dudes. Mm-hmm. And we joke about it. <laughs> Yeah. Yo, we're all older now and shit. We all out of shape and whatever. <laughs> but we all know one thing. We're solid. We're real motherfuckers, right? And so the cats you come up with, like, man, like I miss that smaller circle because you know what's real. You know, you know who's who. And you know, to this day, like I still keep a small circle. You see me with a few people, like my brother Cosmo, my brother Stingy, a couple people I'd really be around and my team my team that's in the building right now. These are people I allow myself to be around, but I do miss that before it was burner days, you know? Yeah. That shit was fun. Mm. It's new project, man. Seed to Sale is definitely one of the fun, most fun listens I had this year. For sure. That No Nightmares is powerful, too. Mm. That's just super real. And, like, there's a lot of details in what I went through. And I almost didn't put that shit on there. I mm. was like, man, it's a little, it's kind of negative and shit. I'm like, but going back to it, it's, it's what's real. Mm. It's what's happening. I'm actually glad that you guys even checked out the album, you know. Uh-huh. I was I didn't I didn't expect you guys to be even looking at what I'm doing music Come on, business 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 it makes sense but music yeah. like the fact you guys checked it out and you fuck with it that means a lot to me too because we do put a lot of effort into this music like yeah. from like you know the production side of it to the mix and master like we really mix and master every beat yeah. and like I see a lot of acts now some of the biggest acts in the world I'll get a beat folder from someone yeah. and I'll hear a tag on that beat mm. right and then someone will call me like I actually went to so and so. Then I'll hear the album come out like a day later and the tag will, I'm like, they didn't even mix that beat. <laughs> and it's right. the biggest song in the country and they didn't mix that beat. Yeah, I'm like, we're sitting in, finished, yeah. we're sitting there for 14 hours fucking with kicks and drums and all this bullshit and they didn't even mix it. the beat. But it's good to hear that y'all actually took a listen because I feel like the music, like it's it's like a polo shirt. It's going to sound good 10 years from now. Well, I think it's crazy that you have so many so much content you put out already, but I feel like this run you're on kind of with Gotti and now this record is like, yeah. To me, it's bringing a lot more eyes to it. Like mm-hmm. you put a lot of work into getting this, and it just seems like business-wise, and even with the music, things are continuing to elevate. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna keep elevating. I think the music is gonna get like a little more interesting. Um, the kind of collabs I'm trying to put together now are insane. Yeah, mm-hmm. like insane. Like not even like anything that anyone would ever picture, and it's not even really on some rap shit. It's just on some music shit. Yeah, and I think that once those kind of things will come out. I think it's going to be big. I'm going to put it in the universe right now, and I hope I don't blow my load. And It's probably the worst thing I could possibly do, but I'm just going to put it out there. But me, Erica, Badu, and Bob, we are talking about doing something right now. And mm. 
just on a just on a on a song. You're talking about the Grateful Dead, Badu and Burn. Like mm. that's just a total different vibe that no one's ever gonna. Yeah. Ex- how would that even sound? Right. Mm-hmm. How how would that record sound right now? Who knows? <laughs> Hopefully, you get a chance to hear that motherfucker. It's interesting because I feel like you always talk about you know your passion as an artist, but you also have that sort of A and R side of you. Oh, yeah, like, I feel sure. like that's really like also part of you. Nah, also, I'm, right? I'm gonna get into that. Like if um, you know, when I decided to put down the, the mic officially, which every artist says they're gonna do and never does it, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that. But when I get bored of actually like putting full projects together, I really want to. I want to A and R Mozzie album bad. Mm. Real bad. I really yeah. want to get with Mozzie and do a whole project. I want to A&R Wiz album really bad. Yeah. Really bad. I can see you do the Khaled type shit. I can see yeah. you really mm-hmm. just put artists together in different slots in the whole situation. Because we've been doing this so much. When you when you got 47 bodies of music and you have to fill in these gaps and you're doing group albums, you understand like who would sound good on this, who wouldn't sound good on this. What would be different for this artist to sound? And like, if you take this artist like and put them on a sample beat, how would that sound? Like when I took down south artists and put them on sample beats, it sounds so sick. Mm. No one was ever doing that. They yeah. was all rapping on trap beats and shit yeah. like that. So yeah. I feel like we we bring some cool shit to the table. How do you look at the state of, outside of your music, the state of hip hop right now? Do you feel inspired? Do you, are things that stand out to you? I feel like the biggest problem with hip hop is probably like how fast things move. Like you drop something and it's cool for like three days and then people are just moving. So I wish things lasted a little longer, but that's just, you have to adapt with change. I think the biggest problem with hip hop is the stream shit. They got paid more for that shit. Mm-hmm. It don't make no sense. <laughs> that streaming shit don't make no sense right. to me. Uh, Business wise. like they, I miss the days when I would go to City Hall Records and drop off 10,000 physical albums and get paid $5 an album and get my cash. Right. I miss those days. Mm. I miss cash. I miss <laughs> Every time I get it, I play with it. Extra long. I just sit there with it and hold it. <laughs> it I'll pay with it. You know what I'm saying? But now they treat you like a criminal when you pull up with cash. Yeah. Yeah. It's like don't, people don't expect to be tipped anymore like with cash. Like it's just yeah, like. I'm it's just like, fuck, I'm old school. I keep it. I keep a little stiff. In the sock in the sock. Yeah, you know, back pocket, fuck it. <laughs> But musically, you said that, uh, also on Twitter, you said that you love that you never switch your style or your sound for new trends. No, That's your biggest flex. That. Yeah, I ain't doing that. Because a lot of people do do that. Especially when like when you get when you get on a record with someone else, like people will switch their whole shit up just to try to please that artist. Not people want to hear me for me, mm. right? And, and I've seen a lot of artists try a bunch of different things and get lost. And I think I blame that on the labels. A label will tell someone, this ain't it. How are you going to tell someone that just went and spent hell of time making some music, which is their creative, right? Their creative process to to make something that that's not it. I've never had no one tell me that. So mm-hmm. maybe I played myself. Maybe I didn't. But my my biggest flex is I've stayed true to me. I've never switched up my style. I still wear baggy ass clothes. I still <laughs> sag. I, I still don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? It's like I still wrap the way I was coming in, just a little smoother delivery and and but same same purpose behind every project. That's why I love Seed to Sale. Even though you have the chip on your shoulder, which I enjoy, it has a real cool vibe to it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Because even though I'm mad, these guys, they know I'm a player. We can sit down and figure it out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, but no, don't, don't come for me and expect me not to do nothing. But I'm going to talk my shit like a player, though. Because mm. I feel like when you go on a rant, nothing really gets heard. Mm. I, I agree. Speaking of players, Cooks and Orange Juice, that's the first song on there. You and Larry June gonna reunite for that? Yeah, a sequel, man. maybe? Well, where you at, Larry? Come on, Larry. Come, on, Larry. <laughs> Come pull up to this spiz knot. Yeah, mm-hmm. now we, we talked about doing something because when we dropped that, we didn't really get a chance. What happened? Was it COVID? It or was something? COVID. It came out during. It came out of, during COVID, huh? Yeah. yeah. So we didn't really get a chance to do like a merch collab and a, pro- a proper drop. Like, we didn't really run that bitch up like we were supposed to. And we did it so fast. I think me and Larry talked about doing something else. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I know before we get out of here, you know, we had. See the sale prior to that was guiding. You had Paul Cicero. What's up with the the mafia? Yeah, thing? so I I like to do. My, if you look at my shit, I do my thing like in trios. So like they'd be like draw season one, draw season two, draw season three. They'd be like you know El Chivo La Plaza, and what was the other one? There was an, there was another one that was like themed on the the Latin side, mm-hmm. right? So with the Mafia series, it was um it was Russ Buffalino, Paul right. Cicero, and then Gotti, and I ended Gotti. I ended the Mafia series like with the best way possible. Unreleased audio of John Gotti Sr. Ooh, that was unreleased. Yeah, that was from Wiretaps, brother. Oh, wow. So when I met John Jr., uh, we just, we hit it off. We became good friends. And he told me for this album, what would make this album special is me taking some wiretaps of my father. No one's ever heard. And letting him kind of, you know, 
be a part of the project, yeah. you know, through interlude and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I was like, wow. So he actually brought surveillance tapes and shit like that. And we ripped the audio from that. Wow. So um, that was like the strongest way to end the Mafia series. Mm -hmm. Now we're on the Weed series, you know, from okay. sea to sail. You know, what's going to be the next one? Probably be two more. You know what I'm saying? Probably me and Be Real will come with one okay. on some weed shit. That'll okay. be like our fourth album together. Um, but yeah, I like I like the trios. I like it's like some EPMD type shit. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like right now we're in the mafia vibe. So okay. how we, we gonna run this vibe right now? All right, now we back in the weed. Well, we back in weed world. All right, slick investor talk and this and that, business deals. This mm -hmm. and you know maybe the be real album will be more focused on just big get high tunes. You know I don't know, but that's how I like to do yeah. my shit. Split it up. Cool. And I'm going to see you at Cookie's Christmas, December 15th in L.A. You have a yeah, show? Yeah, at the Novo. This is my first time doing Cookie's Christmas in L.A. I think we did it for like nine or ten years straight in the Bay. It sells out every time at the Warfield. But I've noticed L.A. has been really, really supportive on, on the streaming side of things. They've been one of my biggest fan bases. So the goal is to do it this year in L.A. and then next year do the Bay Area in L.A. So the Bay don't hate me. <laughs> What's your aspect from the show? You know... I like to just provide a good experience for the fans. We come out, we get super high. I always bring out a big guest. Um, <laughs> I brought out a lot of big guests. Um, I don't know what I'm going to bring out this year. I, I don't know if it's going to be like more like my entourage, like intimate, like people I really, really fuck with. If mm -hmm. I bring someone super big out for them, but whatever it is, that place is going to be extra foggy. And if you don't smoke, all you got to do is breathe <laughs> in that motherfucker. You float out that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> really, really float out Cookies Christmas for sure. Floating on top of the Forbes list every yeah, year, yes, man. Sir. On, a, on a big cloud, dressed like Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> After that rich rapper list, and everyone's going to want to see me at Santa Claus this year. <laughs> Bunch of gifts. Word up. Well, thank you for sharing the gems, man. Appreciate you, brother, I man. Appreciate you guys, Continue man. success, brother. Yes, sir. Appreciate you coming all the way out here, too. No doubt. Give, we're flying right back, man. In yeah. and out. This is well, you, if bro. you want to flow home, I got some right <laughs> <laughs> Just got a lot of hash in it, too. But the people saying he didn't even hit it that hard. This is full of hash. Oh, <laughs> man. This is a cheat J right here. This is one of them big J's. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Seed to sale. Rap Radar Podcast. Yes.